Once upon a tabletop, some adventurers discovered that they aren't alone in the world. Hey everyone, I'm Jonathan Rutledge, and this is episode 11 of Colonial Carrier Lark's Landing, a 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons campaign being played at a local hobby shop called The Devil's Bench. While examining a large white stone building that they found in the middle of nowhere, Stor the Goblin Monk peeks around the southern corner looking for a door. What he finds instead is a large ogress who looks down at him and says, Ooh, dinner! However, she says it in the language of giants, so he doesn't understand it. Though out of sight, Shend the Dwarven Ranger and Kordak the Half-Orc Fighter do understand. Kordak rushes up to the corner, shouting in giant, Don't put that in your mouth! The ogress seems quite taken aback and asks why not. Kordak explains that the goblin tastes disgusting. The ogress edges forward a little, playing with her club, saying he looks like a goblin and goblins taste delicious. They talk to her a bit more, asking her things like if she lives alone here. To which she assures them that yes, of course, she does live alone, all the while slowly edging closer to them. Not being fooled by her false intentions, Kordak demands that she puts down her club. She grins and says, okay, and starts to swing the club for him. She clearly thinks she's far more clever than she actually is. Seeing the attack coming, Stor and Kordak quickly react first. Stor backs away, using his inner power to punch blasts of radiant energy at her. In spite of the ogress's larger size, Kordak rushes in and tries to grapple her. She pulls out of his grip, but he does seem to have knocked off her aim. Her club crashes into the ground beside him as she calls out, Eba! Sheba! At her call, a large brown bear comes lumbering out of the building. Further along the side of the building, Balazar, the dragonborn cleric, looks up as he hears a roar. Another bear is on the roof, and it jumps off, slowly floating down towards the ground. As it lands, the bear bites and swipes at him, nearly killing him with the two hits. Seeing the danger their friend is in, Acta, the tiefling warlock, and Shen both attack it. However, they back away to put a bit of distance between them and the dangerous creatures they're facing. Stor sends some more blasts of energy at the bear that came out of the building. Kordak manages to grapple onto the ogress, holding onto her legs and telling her that she can't win. The ogress laughs and keeps attacking, ordering her bear to come and help her get Kordak off of her. The bear obliges. The other bear's attacks get turned aside by Balazar's armor, even as he hits it with his warhammer. However, his blow didn't do much damage to it, so he carefully steps away and runs. The bear chases for a few feet, then gets distracted by Acta. He takes a bite at and swipe at her, and nearly kills her as well. Luckily, Shend is able to take it down with a well-placed arrow, while Balasar hurries over to heal Acta. Just then, Kordak falls under the blows of the other bear and the ogress. The friends turn their full might on the ogress, who is turning to attack Stor. An arrow thuds into her shoulder as Balasar runs over and revives Kordak. However, her club hits true, smashing down on top of Stor's head, knocking him unconscious. Yelling at the ogress, Acta sends a blast of arcane energy at her. The ogress turns just in time to catch it in her face. She stands there for a moment, then slowly topples over backwards, dead at last. Their fury is turned on the other bear, which accepts an arrow hit from Shend. The freshly revived Kordak climbs to his feet and chops its head off. Battle complete, Balazar quickly revives Stor, magically healing his wounds before the unconscious goblin bleeds out. Shend immediately walks up to the ogress and pries out one of her teeth. He hands it to Acta and replies to the other's questioning looks that it was her kill, this is her trophy. This is a common practice with them, so the others accept the explanation. In truth, Acta had told Shen several days previously that she needed the tooth of a giantkin. Shen is fairly confident that ogres are a type of giant. Stor rushes over to the bear that had floated down from the roof. It is wearing a belt with a feather design as a collar, so he takes it for himself. Shen sets about skinning the bears, doing a good job with the beheaded one and getting a perfect pelt from the other. Kordak turns his attention to the front of the building, where there's one door lying on the ground and another hanging from one hinge. He goes in, searching for treasure. Inside he finds a room with the walls covered in what were once frescoes. They have long since been damaged beyond recognition. There are three beds made up of straw and grass, and in one corner a pile of what looks like refuse. Sifting through the bones, ratty furs, and other detritus, Kordak finds a bunch of coins. They're the strangest coins he's ever seen. They're square, with the portrait of a dragonborn on one side and an anvil on the other. He also finds some gems and a vial of some clear liquid. He is joined inside by Stor. Together, they head down a short hallway at the back of the room. As soon as he steps into it, Kordak feels something shift beneath his feet. With a grinding sound, several rusty spears lunge out of the walls. However, they only make it a few inches before the mechanism gives out. Relieved that the trap was broken, they continue on. At the end of the hallway is another fresco, this one in far better condition. They can make out the image of a magnificent, very organized looking city. Around the edges, carved dragonborn heads are looking in on it. 
To the left and the right of the fresco, there are spiral stairways, both leading down. Kordak listens closely, but doesn't hear anything from below. They get the others and tell them what they've found. Since most of them are injured and it's getting late, they decide to bed down for the night. Astor is just setting up for his first watch. He hears a noise. It sounds like screeching voices and flapping getting closer from outside. He warns the others and they all hide. Before long, the voices stop for a moment, then Storr hears a surprised, DEAD? This is followed by some excited chatter and more flapping. Then the noises stop, being replaced by the sounds of tearing flesh and eating. Storr looks out just long enough to see three winged women feasting on the ogress. He recognizes them as harpies. For a long time, the adventurers huddle in silence, afraid that they're not strong enough for another battle. Suddenly, the sounds of eating stop. Then the flapping and screeching voices start up again, slowly getting farther away. When he's sure they're gone, Stor tells the others, and they get back to sleep. On the third watch, Shend is looking out of the doorway, and he notices something off in a copse of trees. He thinks it's a flicker of light, but it's gone so fast he can't be sure he even saw it. He doesn't think it's worth mentioning, but he keeps a sharp eye out. They awake in the morning and continue exploring the building. They head downstairs, where they find another room lined with frescoes. In the center is a beheaded statue surrounded by six benches. Balzar finds the statue's head under one of the benches. It's still recognizable, if barely, as a dragonborn head. At the base of the statue, there's some writing in Draconic. Balzar and Acta relay to the others what it says. The great Rovar, first emperor of Drovenar, he forged this empire with his breath. They all get excited about this, but none so much as Balzar. Stor realizes that the name Drovenar is familiar to him. He hasn't heard of this empire, but he knows that the continent they came from has a city known as New Drovenar. They believe they may have found the origins of Balzar's people. They look around the frescoes on the walls, but they are also heavily damaged. They are able to make out the shapes of humanoids who seem to be building things. There also seems to be a repeated theme of anvils. They realize that the anvil is the holy symbol of Marara, the goddess of crafting and tradition. There are two more bronze doors at the end of the room. Shend checks them for traps, and finding nothing on them, Akta and Stor kick them open. The next room has three stone slabs against each wall. The far wall across from the door has a stone desk, a stone chair, and a stone bookcase. The shelves on the bookcase are covered with dirt and dust. The stone slabs each also have a pile of dirt on them, and a pile of dirt at the foot of each of them as well. They take turns sitting in the chair, but nothing happens. They think that the stone slabs look like tombs, but they don't have lids. In an amazing feat of strength, Kordak manages to shift one aside to find nothing underneath them. Looking more closely, Shen realizes that the dirt has the same pattern on all of the slabs. Digging beneath the dirt, he finds a worn divot in the stone. He comes up with the suggestion that these were perhaps beds, not tombs. Standing in the middle of the room, Balzar casts Detect Magic. He's certain there must be more here. He's surprised when he doesn't find any magic on the lower level, but he can sense some from the upper level. Some potentially coming from outside the front of the building. However, the one that draws his attention more and that he walks to is the fresco at the top of the stairs. He realizes that this fresco may have survived the damage because of the magic infused in it. He reaches out to touch it and press on it. Nothing happens. So he casts Identify to discover its properties. He discovers that it is indeed enchanted, but part of the enchantment hides what the enchantment is. He is very impressed with this, and a little confounded. However, the adventurers decide it's probably time they should be on their way. As they head out, Balzar remembers that he'd noticed some magic from this area as well. When he mentions it, Shen realizes it that he'd noticed a discrepancy in the ogress's clothing. She'd been wearing a fur bikini top, but her loincloth was cloth. They take a closer look at the loincloth, and Balzar casts Identify on it. It is, in fact, a very filthy cloak of protection. They seriously consider leaving it behind, but instead they have Acta clean it with her magic. Stor, who's discovered that the belt that he took from the bear is a belt of feather falling, climbs up to the top of the building and floats down just to test it. Kordak chops off the ogress's head to bring home with him. As they're preparing to leave, Shend notices a flicker of movement in the copse of trees he'd seen light in last night. He tells the others and they head over to investigate. As they approach, Stor hears voices gabbling in the goblin tongue. He understands their words as an argument over whether or not they'd been seen. Eventually, the decision is that they had been seen, and a pair of goblins step out from the trees. After another conversation about not wanting to get killed, they carefully lower their weapons to the ground and wait for the adventurers to approach them. The goblins are in awe of the adventurers, having seen them kill Ugra. 
They claim the ogress has slaughtered an army that their tribe sent against her. They're even more impressed when they look under Storr's head and discover he's a goblin. They're a little confused as to what the others are. They recognize Kordak as being part orc. They think Akta is a demon. They have no idea what Shend is, and they think Balazar is a fat lizard man. Balazar disapproves of this description. Conversing with the goblins, they discover that they have a tribe nearby. Kordak pulls the group together for a quick meeting. He's been carefully hiding the goblin heads on his belt underneath his cloak. He suggests it might be possible to open friendly relations with the goblins. The group agree, but they want to go back to town to get their friend Gilligan, the human mystic, first. Plus, they need to clear Stor's name now that they have proof there are other goblins around. They suggest to the goblins that they bring their leader here as neutral ground for a meeting. The goblins are even more afraid of their leader than they are of the adventurers. They say, No one tells Grubfrub what to do! They hesitantly agree to deliver a message to their leader. They'll either bring their leader here or lead the adventurers to their camp in a ten day, the next full moon. The goblins head off to the east and the adventurers head home. Shend and Stor think that if they go in a straight line they might be able to make it back in three days, but they don't want to risk it. They choose to retrace their steps instead, taking four days. Those days pass without incident, and they arrive at home late at night on the 14th of Waning Spring. In spite of the late hour, Kordak wants to call the council meeting right away. He approaches some militia members to set this into motion, but they tell him, somewhat nervously, that they're not allowed to take orders from him anymore. Kordak has been removed from command of the militia. Hargrom is now in charge. Not very happy about the situation, they go to find Hargrom to find out what's going on. Upon opening his door, Hargrom can tell that Kordak already knows. He says that he'd wanted to tell him himself. Hargrom was opposed to the decision, but the council had decided that Kordak wasn't suited to lead the militia. There were many arguments made for and against him, but there is one deciding factor. The leader of the militia should remain at the settlement. Hargrom tells Kordak that his friend Gilgan was able to get the council to agree to allow Kordak to make the decision. He can either stay at the settlement and lead the militia, or continue to go on his scouting missions. Either way, Hargrom says that he will still take Kordak's counsel. Accepting this, at least for now, Kordak tells him that he needs to summon the council. They have proof of Stor's innocence, and he shows off the two goblin heads hanging from his belt. Hargrom doesn't think the council will be very happy about being disturbed this late at night, but he agrees. They send out messengers, one of which collects Gilligan. Gilgan is very happy to see his friends returned. When they left, he'd been out in the jungle, hunting, venting his emotions when he discovered that the towers he'd made had fallen down. It turns out that the walls he can make only last as long as he can concentrate. When he returned to find his friends gone, he turned his attention to politics and helping out the settlement where he could. He rushes over to the partially constructed town hall for the council meeting. With the goblin heads presented as evidence, Stor's name is cleared. Not everyone on the council agrees, but they're forced to go with the majority. The adventurers then ask what's been going on. From the moment they came into camp, they'd noticed that the mood was darker. Most of the council heads off home to sleep, but Deltria stops to chat with them. Their dwarven friend informs them that food is being rationed again. Some rats had gotten into Naldor's store and were contaminating the food. As if that wasn't bad enough, a few days later, more rats got into the main food storage. With most of the local land being foraged in for over a month, and the crops at the farms not yet grown, they're running dangerously low on food. Balazar and Acta exchange a look. Deltria continues to explain that there's also the issue of the murder. The council had wanted to keep it quiet, but somehow word had gotten out, along with the rumor that Stor was the murderer. None too happy about any of this, the adventurers go home for the night. Before going to sleep, Acta slips off on her own. She pulls out a special stone that was given to her and whispers a message into it. She announces that she has the Tooth of Giantkin and asks if it might be possible to get a favor in return for it. And that's where tonight's session comes to a close. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and leave a comment down below letting me know what you think. If you want to support this channel, there's a link for that down in the description, as well as a link to my website where you can buy the chainmail that I make. That's it for today. Check back in a week to find out what happens next, once upon a tabletop.